I'm Allison Singer with the Autism Science Foundation here today at the Seaver Autism Center at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. We're joined now by Dr. Alex Kolovzen. He's the clinical director at the Seaver Center, and his research is focused on developing new pharmacological treatments that target the core symptoms of autism. And I know you had some big news to share that came out just yesterday. Why don't we start with that great news? Uh, so about six months ago, actually, we applied to the FDA to use a drug called insulin-like growth factor one, and we were given what was called an exemption, which allowed us to study this drug for research purposes, and then we went through a very long process of getting it approved by the institution. So just yesterday, our internal review board, which is kind of charged with protecting human subjects, uh, has given us approval to begin a trial, which we're very excited about. So tell me about the trial and tell me what insulin-like growth factor can do for kids and who will be enrolled in the trial. So based on collaborations with our basic science folks who've been studying this specific gene, which is called the Schenck 3 gene, we understand Schenck 3 to be responsible for about a half a percent to one percent of cases of autism. Our basic science friends have developed model systems, both a mouse model and a rat model, where they're able to sort of recapitulate the genetic defects in the mouse and then use that mouse model to test specific kinds of drugs. And so we were trying to figure out which drugs would be potential targets, and we looked first to the universe of which was out there, commercially available drugs, and we found this growth factor. And we think it's acting essentially as a growth factor to help neurons communicate better with one another and to correct some of the deficits associated with this Schenck 3 deletion syndrome, essentially. And so the next step is to do a very small trial in a controlled fashion, though, with about 10 folks with this condition, children with this condition. So in the mouse models where the mice have the Shank 3 mutation, this um, IGF-1 was successful in reversing what types of deficits? So it's a good question. So we measure a lot of different things. You can measure behavioral deficits. You can measure electrophysiological deficits. In other words, the way that the brain actually really communicates with itself, the way that neurons send signal from the one side of the neuron to the other side of the neuron. And what we found were deficits associated with the, the version of the mouse that had a missing copy of the gene. Those deficits were actually reversed. So it was an electrophysiological deficit that was reversed under the influence of drug. But a specific process called long-term potentiation was the process that seemed to be significantly improved in the mice that got this drug. And that's a process that really has a, a critical, critical role in learning and memory. So we're thinking that it actually could potentially underlie a whole host of symptoms and possibly modify the disease course. So what types of symptoms did you see in the mice with the Shank 3 mutation that you didn't see after you gave them the new drug? So we haven't done as much of the behavioral phenotyping of the mice as we'd like to. One good example, though, is something called a rotor rod experiment, where you see how well a mouse can balance on a rotor rod and how quickly it falls off. The children that we've seen with these Shank 3 deletions actually have very significant motor skills deficits and difficulties in terms of their gait, and of course difficulties with learning and memory. And so there's a nice kind of connection there where in the mice, under the influence of IGF-1, they were able to stay balanced and stay on that rotor rod much longer than the mice without IGF-1, and who, both of whom had these, these Shank 3 deletions. So that would be motor issues. What about other core deficits like learning, like behave, repetitive behaviors? So these are all things we can measure in the mouse model, and these are all things that we're working on right now. At the moment, what we've, what we've looked at most carefully are the, the, the kind of core biological deficit in terms of how the, the brain actually communicates with itself. So when we now move into human clinical trials for IGF-1, you'll be starting with kids with the Shank 3 mutation or Phelan McDermott syndrome, but that's about half to 1% of the population of children with autism spectrum disorder. So how will this also be beneficial for children with autism spectrum disorder who don't have this particular deletion? Yeah. So, you know, if you look at a lot of the genes that have been identified to date in autism, it does seem that there are a number of final common pathways, many of which relate to the glutamate system and many of which actually regulate these learning and memory processes. What we're hoping to figure out is that this drug, for example, and this, this specific monogenic form of autism is much more broadly related to autism in general and that some specific treatments are going to be 
relevant to not just kids with Shan3 deletions, but also kids where we don't necessarily know what the deletion is or what the genetic cause is at the moment. And that's what the FDA approved yesterday. They approved a trial in children with the Shank 3 deletion correct. and a separate trial for children with autism without the Shank 3 deletion. Is that correct? So about six months ago, the FDA gave us an exemption and allowed us to study IGF-1 in kids with the Shank 3 deletion. Soon after that, we followed up with a request for an exemption in children with autism without the, the Shank 3 deletion. And we, both of these have been approved. In terms of our own internal reviews and, and the study that we're prepared to start right now, we're only starting first with these kids with Shank 3. If, in fact, there's some benefit, we're going to move very quickly to start studying kids without the Shank 3 deletion, but autism more broadly. So when will you start to enroll children in this trial? Hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, there's a couple of steps because we're really focused on safety. So there's a lot of medical evaluations and neurological evaluations that have to be done. This is actually, it's, it's somewhat of a high-risk drug. It's not something that people should be going out there and starting to use now. Um, and we want to be very, very careful about it, especially with our first few patients. But I expect, you know, within the next month we'll be enrolling patients. Now, the Seaver Center has done many other pharmacological treatment studies, including a lot of work on oxytocin. Can you talk a little bit about the work you've done on oxytocin? Sure. So the, the work in oxytocin at the Seaver Center goes back m many years now. I mean, it began with our previous director, Eric Hollander, Evdokia and Ignastu followed up with a lot of work uh, also. And most recently, Jennifer Bartz, who's since left us, unfortunately, and moved to uh, McGill, started a study looking at adults on the autism spectrum using intranasal oxytocin, so she was giving it intranasally, and she was doing uh, an fMRI, a functional scan, before and after administration, and looking to see whether there was an improvement in what's called empathic accuracy. So we're, we're really interested, and the field in general is really interested in the idea that oxytocin can, can selectively improve social cognition deficits in, uh, in autism. And this, of course, is a core symptom, so it's, it's potentially quite exciting. There's a fair amount of evidence that there's some dysregulation in the oxytocin system in autism. There's also a lot of evidence that oxytocin can improve social cognition outcomes in typically developing adults, even already a few studies in, in adults with autism. And now we're in the middle of this challenge study. So it's really one dose of oxytocin or a dose of placebo, and, and we do sort of what's called a crossover. And, um, and we put people in a scanner so we can actually see the underlying neural circuitry in the brain along with measuring behavioral outcomes around empathic accuracy. Let's talk a little bit about just the general Seaver Autism Center and what you do here. It's one of the few comprehensive centers we have in the United States. Tell me a little bit about why this center has become uh, so special. So we've spent a lot of time over the last four or five years really trying to integrate what we're learning from the basic science side, from genetic discovery, and, and translating it to the, the clinic, essentially. So we, we, we've done a lot of work now in clinical trials, and the history of autism, unfortunately, is sort of riddled with a lot of failed trials. And so the, the direction that we're moving in now is trying to think about monogenic causes of autism, trying to learn about the pathophysiology, and trying to develop very targeted treatments. And what's unique about our center is that we actually have the capability of going from the genetic discovery side, from literally from the molecule or the gene, all the way to the clinic. And what's happened over the last few years is that pathway has gotten more and more uh, rapid, essentially. And so just in the last 18 months, and we talked about Shank 3, Dr. Buxbaum developed the mouse, we found the drug, and now it's, I mean, it's 18 months later and we're starting a clinical trial. So it's a, it's a really kind of rapid pathway, and the fact that we can all do it here makes it unique. The other nice thing is we've got a pretty broad um, expertise, so that there's clinical psychologists, and there's research psychologists, and there's child psychiatrists, and neurologists that work with us. And so I think that that kind of collaborative, interdisciplinary approach has really strengthened our ability to think about these trials in, in a really productive way. So if there are families whose children have the Shank 3 mutation and they're interested in getting involved in this trial, how would they do that? How should they contact you? So they call our center, and they, this is a very strong family foundation, and, and they, they, they have a lot of support uh, through their foundation, and so that they all have our contact information, which I'm happy to give out, and you can put it on the bottom of the screen. So Jessica Zweifak is our, is our coordinator, 212-241-2826. <laughs> and uh, we also have a website, the Shank 3 Gene, www.shank3gene, I think it is. And, um, 
and there's going to be a lot of information put out there by the by the Family Foundation. Well, we are so excited uh, to see another trial moving into human clinical trials. I know it's it's a process, and the process sometimes feels like it takes a very long time from the parents' point of view. But we really appreciate uh, the work you're doing, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for having me.